Hi there, my name is David Guerra and I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I was in the Army from uh, 85 to 89 during the Cold War. Um, I'm from Texas and I write books. My latest book is Parade Season. And Parade Season is a story of Four soldiers, four friends, four roommates in, in West Berlin during the mid-1980s. And these soldiers, every year, well, in Berlin, every year during summer, spring, summer seasons, the soldiers would go out and parade and march around. It's not like a parade you see here at, 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 at home, here in the States, where you'd have the pretty girls and the Corvette cars and, and the floats and, and clowns, lots and lots of clowns. No, it's not like that. Well, the military parades are a little different. See, we have soldiers, you have tanks, you have uh, artillery pieces, and you have a band, and you have clowns, lots and lots of clowns. But that's for a different time. Um, so anyway, so during this time, they're, they're out there parading and showing the, the colors, showing the, flying the flag, showing the flag, meaning showing the United States colors to the citizens of Berlin. And during the Cold War, Berlin was an occupied city. It means it was, it was divided into four sectors. The American sector, the British sector, and the French sector. And East Berlin was the Soviet sector. That's right, the Soviet Union. They were our enemies, but during World War II, they were our allies. And once World War II ended, the agreements said, you know, Germany gets, I mean, Germany gets divided and Russia gets a big part of it, and the United States gets a big part of it, and Britain gets a big part of it, and France gets a little part of it. It's just the way it all worked out. And um, so that's what we did. We actually did it for a couple of years, did a couple of parade seasons. I actually marched in these parades while I was in West Berlin with the United States Army. And in the story, the soldiers get caught up in everyday life and with everybody, and little things happen to soldiers especially soldiers that have gone away from home for the first time. Soldiers that have no idea what the military is all about. And things happen. They can fall into these little pitfalls, little traps, and a lot of those pitfalls and traps deal with money. Money. They're away from home. They're excited. They're in a big city. They're in a world city, in this case Berlin. And things can be expensive. Things can get out of control real quickly. And the story talks a little bit about that. Which actor or actress would, or actor would I like to see play? Well, if this was in the mid-80s, I'd say Matthew Broderick, but it's not. He's a little older. We're all a little older now. But who would I like to see him play now? You know, it'd have to be a nice, up young, up-and-coming actor, somebody who's eager, hungry, ready to learn, because this is a role of, of a soldier, and... And to be plain soldiers, you better be the part now. You know, you've got to be the part. You can't just fake it anymore, especially playing somebody in the military. Because of everything that's happened since the end of the Cold War to where we are today in 2016, it's going to have to be somebody that's basically an unknown, somebody who has not been tainted by Hollywood. So if I can come up with a name, I will tell you. But right now, I have no idea. Because everybody else has kind of already been tainted. Okay, thank you for asking, which I kind of left out at the very beginning. The Occupied Berlin series of books is ten books that tell a story from ninth, the stories of what we did in Berlin from 1945 to 1990 when reunification, when Germany reunified, a little bit after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Or, you know what, I'm actually just going to stop at the fall of the Berlin Wall because things change rather quickly after that, and our mission, mission in Berlin was different. So these stories are based on American soldiers, U.S. soldiers, and in this case, always, the main character is going to be from South Texas. I'm just kind of partial to South Texas. And it takes place in various times. The first book started off just as World War II was ending with the Soviets, and at the end of the story, it ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall. The next book, uh, Airbridge Berlin, that one took place during the Berlin Airlift. The third book takes place in 1979, December of 1979, just as the uh, 
just as the uh, American embassy was being stormed by the uh, students in Tehran, Iran. So it kind of, that kind of sits on top of it. But that was like on Christmas Eve, if I remember correctly. And so the entire story takes place at Spandau Prison, which is one of the things that we did, is we guarded then, who was still alive then, was Rudolf Hess. And he was the deputy Fuhrer for Adolf Hitler, and he was sentenced to life at Spandau Prison by the Nuremberg Trials. So I was fortunate enough to participate in the guarding of, of this, this, this individual. Uh, April 1987 was my turn. Um, and so the other stories are going to take place uh, revolving around things and involving things that we as American soldiers, infantrymen, did in Berlin. Now there was tankers and there were aviation people and there were administrative people there in Berlin, but because I was an infantryman, I'm going to tell it from that perspective. Um, sure, we worked with MPs, so there's some MPs and a little bit of military police. MPs are military police, not members of parliament. That's the British. And uh, that, that's kind of the stories that are just going to take place. One's going to take place during the Christmas season. One's going to take place during the train ride from, East, from West Berlin to West Germany through East Germany. Uh, another one's going to take place on the East Berlin side of things, in the Soviet sector. And little things like that, little things that we picked up and we did, I'm just going to kind of tell people about them. And that's what the 10 stories of the Occupied Berlin series is all about. I hope I answered your question. What got me started in writing? I remember when I first joined the military. Well, no, we traveled a lot when, when, my, when we were growing up. My father was in the Army, so we got to travel a lot. And that was kind of a lot of fun. So I'd take down notes, I'd do little things, but nothing really stuck. I went to Germany, I started taking down notes about what I experienced. And then after I left the military, I started writing short stories. Nothing, I, I never published anything. There's this one story that might, might make it into the parade season, or not parade season, might make it into the Occupied Berlin series, and, and it's not, not, nothing to do with parade season. But there's this one story that I've had since I don't know when, and it might just make it into a story one day. What got me started, though, is like, I started writing a nonfiction chronology of the Cold War in Berlin, and it finished, it's complete, it just never saw the light of day as far as it being published, but I use it now as a tool to kind of share with others, hey look, this is what went on, this is what really happened from 45 to, to 1990, or 89, November of 89. We were out there, we were doing this stuff, and this stuff really, really, truly happened. A lot of crazy stuff happened, a lot of true, real-world stuff that, at a moment's notice, could have gone, just with a flip of a switch, it could have just gone bad, horrific, and World War III would have been on. And so, it's a small piece of history, yes, in, compared to the entire thing, but it's also a piece of history that was critical to the future we have, we're living in today. Had it not been for the Cold War, we wouldn't have the Internet. Had it not been for the Cold War, we would not have had cell phones, satellite phones. Had it not been for the Cold War, we wouldn't have GPS on our cell phones. Had it not been for the Cold War, we wouldn't have the home PC, which eventually turned to the tablets, which eventually, or laptops, tablets, smartphones. None of that. All of that can be traced back to the Cold War. I was in Berlin from 1985 to 1987. Uh, why was I there? Is that the question? Yeah, why were you there? Why was I there? Uh, well, I was in the United States Army, and I got fortunate. It was fortunate enough, by sheer luck, that I got assigned to the United States Army Berlin Brigade. Now, they've been there from 45, from J July 4th of 1945 up until when I arrived. They were there, and when I got there, it was one of those things that they tell you. Not everybody gets assigned to Berlin. Not everybody is fortunate enough to just say, I want to go to Berlin, you're going. It, they say it takes a special individual to go to Berlin. So I went. They sent me. I went. I didn't go willingly. I thought I was going to Korea. But I ended up going to West Berlin, and it changed my life, and it has to this day. It continues to change my life. As we get further and further away from November 9, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 
and then October 3rd, 1990, the reunification of Germany. As we get further and further away, um, 26 years now since Germany has been unified, an entire generation has lived without a divided Germany. An entire generation has lived without the threat of nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union. And it's, a, it's like I said, it's a, it's a moment in time which will never, ever, ever come back. It'll never come back. There is nothing that's going on today, that's happening today, that will say, oh look, another Berlin. Oh look, another Cold War. Oh look, another nuclear war, a potential for a nuclear war. There's nothing like that going on right now. So the potential for any of that to return is nil. So I've kind of, myself and there's several other authors and many others that have taken it upon themselves to say, look, there's stories in here that are really, truly valuable to the history of what we did, of what went on. Great movie that just came out, The Bridge of Spies, it takes place at the other end of this, of parade season. It takes place physically, physically, geographically at the other end. This takes place, a lot takes place in East Berlin, West Berlin, East Berlin. Bridge of Spies takes place between West Berlin and East Germany. The bridge is there. I've been to that bridge. And so it's to share these stories and to share the history with others to kind of make people realize that you know, this is really truly happening. Had it not been for the actions of these individuals, these hundreds of thousands of men that went to Berlin over the course of those 45 years, the world would not be what it is today. And I truly believe that. Of course, there were people in, in West Germany, there, there were people in, in Korea, South Korea, in Vietnam, in Japan after World War II, but I... It, I truly believe that West Berlin, because it was the key focal spearhead point where the East met the West, a lot of it happened to, in the positive direction because of what we did there. Yes, yes I do. I write a couple, I write leadership books also. I learned a lot from the greatest leadership factory in the world, the United States Army. You don't go in there and come out not a leader. You are a leader. The moment you take your oath and say, I support and defend the Constitution, it takes a very special person to do that, that's willing to raise their hand and dedicate their entire lives, basically, for the defense of this country, of this nation. And that moment you go in there, you're a leader, you become a leader. Now, automatically, you're not you're put in a leadership position. You still have to learn how to first become a soldier. No, you first learn to not become a civilian. You stop becoming a civilian. They take that away from you. Then they teach you to become a soldier. Then they teach you to become what your occupational specialty is, your MOS, your military occupational specialty. And along the way, you start building your confidence. You start feeling better about yourself, and you start stepping up. And you personally, inside, start growing, start maturing, the next thing you know, you now stand above your peers, the peers that you left behind when you first joined. Now you're head and, sh head and shoulders above them. And that's the military creating leaders. And it is what you do in the military that fosters that growth, that encourages that growth, and makes that growth happen. So you're now in a position of leadership. Now you're responsible not just for the day-to-day the -day of, of, the, of the men you're or women that you're responsible for, you're also responsible for their night times. You're responsible for them 24-7. See, in most civilian jobs, it's 8 to 5, I'll see you tomorrow, have a great night. But in the military, somebody messes up at night, somebody had a little too much fun, guess who's going to get called on the carpet tomorrow morning? That soldier, that soldier's leader, and that leader's leader. It's a chain. So that's why I've been inspired by and train by and, and, and appreciate the leadership that the military has given me. So I take that and I've seen that now since leaving the military. I've worked for the state of Texas, I've worked in the private sector, and it has been interesting to see where you can, you can spot veterans and you can spot individuals that had no military training. It's a different caliber of individual. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but what I'm saying is that to be a leader, it has to show. 
And so I write about that. I try to help make other leaders happen. I try to make other leaders step up, those that don't have that military background. Now, I'm not taking all the military doctrine and putting it in civilian practice, no. But I am saying that there are certain things that people should do, all people should do, to be great leaders and to be great followers and especially to be great members of, team, of, a, of a great team. Hmm, back to the book. Okay. The one thing people should take away from parade season, it's like I said a little bit earlier. These are individuals from all over the United States thrown in this high stress, high intensity location. It's, it, it was a boiling pot at any moment. Anything could have happened. A gun battle should have, could have erupted at any moment. Things could have turned sour real fast in West Berlin. So you, you have these stressors, you have these soldiers, you have these young men who have been trained to go and do a job that they were not, didn't know that they were going to do. In most cases, most people didn't sign up to go to Berlin. It was an option. You could go to Berlin, but most, most people didn't. So what's the one takeaway? Is that the realization that they are not just only individuals, but that, that real life happens to them too. You know, sometimes... They're heroes, but sometimes bad things happen to heroes along the way. After the 10 books of the Occupied Berlin series are done, yes, I do plan on writing something else. And again, I kind of want to stay with fiction. But I'm going to tackle the what-if side of things. What if on November 9, 1989, the Berlin Wall did not fall? What would happen in Berlin? What would have happened in Berlin? I'm going to look at it from the moment of that evening, of that press conference, when that East German, um, that East German official announced that, for all he knew, the borders were open now, or the travel restrictions were happening now. He was wrong, by the way. But I'm going to look at it that everything but that meeting took place. I'm talking about the East Germans coming through Hungary and Austria into West Germany, the, the mass defection that was going on, the climate that was changing. Everything is true up until that night. And then I'm going to say, you know what? Let's see what happened if it didn't. And so, yes, I don't know what it's called yet, but that's where I'm going. Ah, the next book, which would be book number five, halfway there. And am I ready to talk about it? Well, let's just say it's going to take place, a lot of it is going to take place in East Berlin. And it's going to involve a lot of our, a lot of our other uh, counterparts our, our, and our allies. It's going to involve, the first, the first four books didn't use much of the allies. They'd pop in here and there. The, and by the allies, I'm talking about the French and the British. They'd pop in a little bit, but nothing substantial. And the Soviets played a role in a couple of other ones, in a couple of the other books. But now it's going to take all hands on deck. And that's kind of what I'm going to do with this next book. It's going to be all hands on deck, and we're going to have the Brits, we're going to have the French, we're going to have the Soviets, and we're definitely going to have some Germans, a lot more Germans. Um, well, I'm not going to give away the title right now, though. All right, well, that is it for the questions. Thank you for answering them. Thank you.